there. And, and of course, as we um, as we go through this, please either feel free to type into the chat or, or raise your hand or someone get a question out there and I can answer them as we go. Uh, I can also answer them at the end depending on you know, what, what your pleasure is. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll kind of give you an overview. The two bills that we're looking at going through is Senate Bill 1048 and House Bill 1193. They're almost identical, and I, I didn't put the link in here, but if you just Google those bill numbers, um, of course, use 2022, like most states, use those numbers over again for different sessions. I think one of those bill numbers was something about cows. So uh, make sure you put 2022 if you Google it to read the legislation. Um, and these bills are related to what the bill calls progress monitoring, but what most people know are through year, a three-year assessment. So there are other things in the bill of course, there's an accountability discussion of when we, you know, when we might have this uh, count towards school grades and so forth. But, but the main thrust, the main focus of the bills is to shift from an end of the year test for most of our tests uh, to this through year testing model. We'll talk some more about some of the details and thoughts there. Um, our big, you know, our fingers are crossed, uh, you know, session concludes on March, is scheduled to conclude on March 11th. And I say that because uh, the only thing by law that is required to be passed each year legislative session is a budget uh, for the you know, so they can't they can't adjourn session until there's a budget and sometimes that shifts the end date by a couple of days but you know we'll hopefully conclude and I would say a month from now but since February is shorter it's less than a month and, and session concludes and we'll know uh, these bills have the backing of the governor. Many of you may have heard uh, Governor DeSantis's announcement back in sep September that kind of alluded to this. Uh, and then uh, one of the big reasonings is there was a time when districts were required to provide interim assessments. And then around 2015 or 2016, when we saw the big pushback against required mandated testing, the legislative language was changed to say districts may choose to you know, do something to monitor progress, you know, but it's up to them. Even though that change took place in the 2015 legislative session, most districts we saw all give some kind of interim assessment. The vast majority of the districts use uh, iReady in some form or fashion curriculum associates. And uh, of course, NWA map is popular. Uh, Renaissance is uh, uh, the, star, the star suite of assessments is also popular. So even though there's no mandate to use it, districts, you know, students, or most students are already taking some kind of progress monitoring. So the thought was, um, and we also saw as we went through the pandemic, trying to collect data and, and aggregate things across all these different platforms, different scales, different score interpretations, and so forth. The idea was thinking, if districts are doing this anyway, why don't we spend the money and have a unified system that the state can dictate that districts don't have to buy, everybody's using the same thing and districts can use their funds that they used to spend on these things on other things. So we'll talk some of the nuances as we go, but that's, that's generally the thought where it, it wouldn't be an increase in testing, it would be basically a replacement of what's going on out there. And then if we can make these new tests shorter than the current test, then there would also be a reduction in testing time. So those are both goals that we're, that we're looking to, to get out of these, you know, these bills if they pass. Vince, uh, you, sorry. Oops, I'll pause. You, uh, VPK, could you explain, what does that stand for? Okay, I'll, I'll, when I get to that, we'll talk, it's okay. uh, right. kindergarten with the, the uh, VPK program. I'll kind of talk about okay. how that works here in Florida. So, um, so there's some of the reason there, and this would be implemented beginning 2022-2023 school year. So our school year, uh, by law, can start no earlier than August 10th. So you're thinking about this session concluding uh, March 11th, and then by August 10th, we may have an entirely new assessment system in place by then. So um, that's that's one of the major challenges. And as I as you talk about this VPK through grade eight. That is already in statute. That was uh, last, last session's uh, statutory requirement requires a pre-K, uh, which your voluntary pre-kindergarten programs, we have about five to 6,000 providers across the state that are either in public school uh, VPK providers uh, or private providers. The vast majority of our, our providers of VPK are, um, are private providers. Uh, the state, using federal funding funds these programs for kindergarten readiness. And one of the one of the things that we've already also had in place 
was a kindergarten screener at the beginning of the kindergarten year to determine how well the providers uh, were getting kids ready for kindergarten. And as you might imagine, a lot of a lot of the providers had concerns that you know at the end of the year, you know, you've got that summer learning loss, and and what kids are doing in kinder in their kindergarten year is not reflective of where they ended at the end of the year. So one of the reasons for this shift to, to the statewide testing at the VPK program level was to make sure that we could get an assessment throughout the students' uh, VPK or the pre-kindergarten year for, for these providers. So I also add that that's about 200 to 220,000 kids uh, that are in VPK programs across the state. And then we have about 200,000 students in each grade, which I think if you kind of think the scale, uh, that's an important piece there. So. Um, so that 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 law had already passed. So if this law doesn't pass, one effect of that again, this is not relevant. I think to most people is we would we would be required to not only do three times a year progress monitoring or you know three year assessment because of last year's law, we would also be having an end of year assessment because that's what current law calls for. So this these bills actually streamline in that respect by taking the requirements from last year's legislation. Uh, and combining that with some of the requirements to get to a, a more streamlined assessment than what's currently called for. So let me pause there. Does that answer our question? VPK is. Okay, good to go. So uh, the, the uh, legislation, again, this is proposed legislation, calls for progress monitoring at least once at the beginning, which we would call progress monitoring one or PM one in the middle of the year, progress monitoring two, and at the end of the school year, progress monitoring three. And those windows are still to be determined. So probably going to be set by the state. Uh, there's some there's some language in the bills that talks about what the VPK providers have to do, but generally the windows are still to be determined. In this bill, uh, that last assessment is the only assessment that's supposed to be used for either you know student, teacher, school, and district accountability. Uh, many of you know that Florida uh, is one of only 11 states that still has an assessment graduation requirement. Right now, it's the grade 10 ELA test and our algebra one in the course test. We also have the grade three promotion requirement. Students need to get out of our five levels. They need to be a level two or higher in order to be promoted to the fourth grade. Um, so that that PM3 test would be a requirement for you know, graduation, school grades, teacher evaluations for districts that use uh, test scores for teacher evaluations and so forth. Oh. was wrong was there. Okay. Um, really important to note that this is only for this progress monitoring is only for grades three through eight mathematics and grades three through ten English language arts. As I, I, on the webinar. What's up? As I mentioned, if somebody can go on mute or somebody uh, having a side conversation. Thanks. Um, this, this 2021 legislation calls for VPK through grade eight, whereas this new legislation for 2022 uh, is grades three through 10 English language arts. Uh, our end of course tests that were required and we're going to keep the algebra one, geometry, history, civics, uh, and, our science, and our biology would stay these end of year assessments as do our grades five and eight science assessment. What I didn't note here is that currently by law, grades three through six assessments are all given on paper. Uh, so the legislation would make that shift, of course, to go to computer-based tests in grades three through eight and three through 10 ELA. So we would basically do a paper-based testing with the exception of grades five and eight science, which are currently on paper and are currently envisioned to remain on paper for now. So um, moving, in, moving on, the results from uh, those progress monitoring one and two by law would be provided to teachers within a week uh, of the end of the testing window and the parents uh, within, uh, within uh, two weeks of administration. And that last progress monitoring would have to be provided back to districts by May 31st of each year. Currently, state law requires the end of year test results to be provided no later than June 30th. So this is a, in a, an entire month earlier. And one of the reasons that it can be early is we're looking for, um, we're looking for something that's, uh, that's computer adaptive uh, pre-equated so that we can report those results right away instead of having to do the post-equating that we currently do in those fixed forms assessments. The law requires that, you know, the results have to be provided, you know, uh, easy to comprehend. Uh, it must be uh, via a web-based portal, making accessible by mobile devices and so forth. It's, and it could be part of the district's uh, information management system 
the pardon wave and get that light back on. Sorry, <laughs> motion light there. Um, we, uh, you know, we we have that concern there that you know the vendors don't really know who which parents require that access, right? And we know if, if you're in a school or in a district, a student's, you know, the parental rights change from day to day. You know, one day you have one set of parents that have access and another day that changes. So it's going to be, it's going to really be important to leave that to the districts and not to the, you know, not to the vendor to determine which parent has access to the, to those reports. So that, that is a, that's a logistical challenge that we're really, we're really aware, aware of. So here I talk about the early learning coalitions. And I mentioned those 8,000 VPK providers. Um, our, our VPK providers are set up in coalitions. Uh, if you kind of think they're sort of a district, for example, the early learning coalition of the Big Bend, where Florida makes its bend from the Panhandle to the peninsula, where, where Tallahassee is. The counties, uh, you know, Leon County, where Tallahassee is located, and the surrounding counties are part of the Big Bend coalition. So these coalitions acting like the district would provide, that we would provide individual student reports to the coalition students and the parents in accordance with this format that would be in state board rules. So we would give the scores to the coalitions and the coalitions would be responsible for making sure that the parents at each VPP provider gets those results. Again, if you think about 8,000 8, different programs, um, that in itself is a huge challenge. Uh, interesting part of the law here is an independent study. Uh, we're got a couple of years to do this. So by January 31st of 2025, we'll have a study that will talk about uh, using the first and or second progress monitoring administration um, in, in lieu of this, this third administration. So for example, if a student does the first and or the second, can that stand in the place of the third? Or can we accelerate students based on that? We also have, I mentioned that grade three retention, a student may uh, be promoted mid-year if they do well on, on certain other meet requirements. So the question would be um, from the study, can we use those first or second, first and or second progress monitoring to determine that promotion? Uh, can we streamline testing further? Can we make the blueprint even shorter? That'll be part of that, uh, part of that, you know, that, that study while also knowing that the entire system as we initially design it and whatever it finally looks like is going to have to meet all of the assessment period requirements of the federal government. So we've had conversations with the department at this point, just basically saying we understand that requirement and that that's going to be our goal is to have something that will meet those requirements. Um, and I mentioned about the remote testing. I think Florida is not alone in that you've got quite a number of, of virtual providers. We have the entire Florida virtual school system that's statewide. And then our 67 districts uh, may have their own franchise of a virtual school. We also have virtual charter schools. Currently, we require all of those students to come into a, a public school district brick and mortar, either a school building or a district select site to test. And as you can imagine, I, as again, Florida is not alone in this, that is a huge challenge to get students uh, in just for one testing event. So the, the question is, how can we possibly do this three times a year and make sure that we get all students tested and not, um, you know, not have parents taking kids and you know, think about Miami-Dade as one school district. Uh, it's a, it's covered a, a huge area. There's 400,000 students in, in the school district and, um, you know, making parents travel a great distance across a large county, a, a very densely populated county is, uh, is a challenge that we know that we have to overcome. Um, so, there, so we're looking forward to the results of that study and, and ways to, to, to accomplish all of the things that the study is, is having us investigate. And the last bullet here, you know, possibly one of the other things is very, very significant is accommodations. Again, states know that if you provide Braille or large print or you provide a paper-based accommodation, getting those things designed, developed, and produced and out to districts is a challenge once a year. And so we know if we're gonna have an equitable, even, even though progress monitoring one and two wouldn't count towards accountability, students need to have that, that equitable and equal access to those accommodated versions. So uh, how that looks in year one will in all likelihood be very different from how that looks in, in later years, especially you know, given that you know, March 30th, March 11th end of session and a, and a potentially August 10th start to testing 
what you're able to, to do and, and get in, in place as far as those accommodations is, is going to be you know, a challenge. One good thing about the 22-23 school year, just like every other year that a state changes test, it's that baseline year. It's almost almost akin to an operational field test where you know you, you can do some kind of equal percentile linking um, to you know as a hold harmless basically while you while you while you implement the first year of an assessment system. But um, you know we know that we're going to have to solve those problems with a com or the the issues or the challenges with accommodation is not a problem. Uh, and we just know there'll be other considerations as well, but these are some of the ones that we're thinking about. And then, as I mentioned, you know, the uh, virtual schools uh, and charges, I already talked about a lot of that already, uh, how, to, how to test those students at brick and mortar schools uh, in, in, in those large districts, as I mentioned previously. So um, we are working internally. I said, I have a meeting with uh, the chief of staff and my boss, deputy commissioner, his name is Juan Copa. Uh, to talk about some of these questions uh, regarding budget and so forth. Um, and we, we work, we've already had heard from some of our, our colleagues in our districts, uh, to some of the things that are on their mind, some of which you already see on this list here. Uh, and then of course our own internal discussions. Uh, we have a, a very large office. The Office of Assessment has 65 staff. Um, and we, many people have been doing this work for a number of years. So I think we have a pretty deep bench, a pretty good grasp of, of some of the challenges. Um, but, you know, even then, we know we have to lean on our, our partners in the districts who are, you know, the boots on the ground, many of whom also have been doing this for a long time uh, and, and know the kinds of things that we need to know to help them uh, make this a successful implementation. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and see if there are questions or thoughts. I see a very thoughtful emoji on, uh, on the screen. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Well, Michael, Michael had a question about, I think, kind of the fall, winter, and then the spring, kind of the makeup of the assessments, length, and, and whatnot. Um, can you talk about kind of, are they shorter? And, and you mentioned kind of the testing time, and potentially you could save some testing, testing time. Yeah, great. Um, we had a really, really great questions. I'll see kind of a follow-on question about right. design, with the system design, and so forth. So um, get, right now we use fixed forms, and I would say you know, we have five achievement levels. So when we designed the current set of tests, you know, Florida standards assessment, we we were concerned about the the um, accuracy that the cut scores. You know, we're not just level three is you know out of the five levels, level three is what's considered proficient or satisfactory. But we know there's also stakes involved. The accountability system. Uh, it really speaks to students who are in level one, you know, the lowest 25% and so forth. So we're looking for accuracy there. And so we made the tests long and we think that they're, they're longer than they need to be, but to, it, even to be as reliable and, and develop what reliable as they need. So we think even if we didn't do anything, we thought the next generation test could be shorter. One of the other things that we did was we, we err on the side of large sample sizes for our field test items. So we, any student sees quite a few field test items, and we think we can trade some in counts again with 200,000 students per grade. We have that luxury um, to take, a, we can have more, more field test forms with a, with a few thousand fewer students seeing an item and still have, and still have a, a very sufficient robust sample. So giving kids fewer field test items in addition to fewer operational items can shorten the test. Um, and we also see, I think this is a, your question kind of begs this discussion as well. I think a lot of states have thought about, are you going to try to drive instruction? And is your blueprint going to be different based on the pacing, uh, you know, logical, you know, a logical progression? And we thought much like you see with what's on the shelf, off the shelf now, the iReadies, the stars and so forth. Basically those tests, you're, you're seeing the entire bank for the entire year. So you're, you're, to put those items all on the same scale, you know, we, we see the value in making sure that students see the items in different positions, you know, they'll be, they'll be you know, randomly assigned in the first year. The only statistics we'll have are on the items that are being field tested this spring. As I mentioned, they'll only be the end of the year, range three through six field test items are on paper. So you'll have some stats and those stats really don't tell the whole story. Uh, on those items and then we'll have other items that have been developed this year and won't be field tested until they're operationally field tested. So this first year, and I think like any other large scale program that's using computer adaptive models, 
is not truly computer adaptive because you don't have the size of the bank and you don't have the statistics to make it truly adaptive. So your, your goal there is just to get the items out there exposed throughout the, the uh, progress monitoring windows one, two, and three, and in different positions to, to negate that position effect that we know can, can be a challenge for fixed forms. Um, we think like, for example, uh, our mathematics tests are all given over two days and our ELA tests are all given over two days. Even if we didn't go to this, we know that we can have a math test in one day. And we're gonna have an ELA test in, in one day. The session may be a little bit longer, but uh, we think that we can do it and not, and not fatigue the students unduly. So those things alone are gonna, would lead to you know, a shorter test. And uh, we do think the, the, the end of the year blueprint might be slightly longer than, because it's for accountability purposes. Uh, to make sure that we that we get the the um, the validity the liabilities that we need for those tests. Um, so I think does that Michael does that answer your question so far as much as we know? Yeah, you did a you did a great job with all that. I, my other question was about the computer adaptive nature of a of an accountability grade level test. Uh, and where I was coming from that uh, as a district that used to have uh, map interview map. Uh, we no longer do. One of the reasons we got rid of it was, was the idea of difficulty and complex nature of questions being different. So it might say a first grade student was ready for fractions when it really hadn't fully explored their knowledge in a deep way of more grade level appropriate standards. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think one of the things right now, if PM1 and PM2 aren't gonna be used for accountability. I think there may be students for it's appropriate to dip, to dip down into the, a lower grade level to see where they are. However, if you're going to roll those PM1, two, and three up or use PM1 and two in your accountability system in some way, then the off grade level thing, then you're getting into territory where you're, you're not compliant with the requirements of, of ESSA and, and the federal peer review assessment. So, so that's one challenge that I, I don't think we've, you know, that we've gotten yet. And some of your, some of the concerns that, you know, Florida was one of the latest, one of the last states to even consider computer adaptive testing for exactly those reasons. It's hard to communicate to parents that it's still fair that if, you know, if, um, you know, Vince is a struggling person, his test was quote unquote easier than Darren, who's a genius who got all the really, really hard questions. But, you know, we know, and there's, I'm sure there's a way we haven't quite gotten there yet to explain it to the public that because these all these items are all matched to the same blueprint, they all come from the same bank, and they've been tested on a on a you know a population that we think is is steady enough from year to year, that the scores all mean the same thing, even though students are seeing tests that are a little bit a little bit different difficulty than. Than another than another person sees, and just by the fact that you've got computer adaptive tests that have been approved by by the feds in, in peer review, means that you know you you've got your defensibility there as far as having different tests for different students. So I'm glad to say the question about uh, who designed the strategy and the system was I involved in, and yes, I will say it's been it's been really. Good. There are some things, you know. Obviously, there's always decisions that you, you know, you, you wish input would be heard a little bit differently. But yes, uh, they leaned heavily on. Uh, we were able to talk to our technical advisory committee a number of times about this. Uh, we've got kind of an all-star attack. Uh, obviously, the vendor has been involved, and then we, our technical advisory committee, has a number of district assessment people on it from our, from our, from our larger districts. Um, many of whom, some of whom have, you know, advanced degrees, PhDs and so forth. So it was, it was a group effort to, to guide the policy and, and implementation, you know, to this point. Uh, so yeah, we have, we have had say in how the system system's been designed. Uh, and Kathy, I think I've answered the question about the, the you did. PM1 and 2, okay, good. Yeah, so that's good there. And then, uh, Working with other states, we have, um, uh, we know that states are eager and interested to, to go to through your test. We know that a lot of, a lot of states have considered shelf products and we did too, but one of the big challenges for us, you know, as you may have heard, again, I don't think we're, we're different than this. I think Nebraska didn't adopt Common Core. So we had adopted Common Core and then we had said we got rid of Common Core, but didn't really 
and you know now these standards are very very different from common core and, and like you know i you hear that from people and like yeah right you know that's you know yeah that and they really are i mean they're, they're quite different so our concern with using the shelf product especially and some of those vendors you know claim that their their materials aligned to common core was just something that we were we were concerned about as far as shelf products go and I think the questions that I've talked about, there was a great, I think the recordings are still there. The uh, Center for Assessment had some webinars they held. A, it was in November. It was actually in our technical advisory committee meeting. And the questions about pacing, where, you know, do you assess all the content in, across all PMs? That, that concerns people. And then rolling PM1 and PM, or the first and second up into a summative score with the third were probably some of the biggest concerns that we heard uh, from our colleagues in other states and from some of the measurement experts. And we think, you know, based on the design that I've talked about, we think we're approaching those, we hope in the right way that we're going to take a, we're going to take a wait and see a cautious approach to, to jumping into some things and then maintaining a blueprint that's consistent throughout the year. A great question about incorporating performance tasks in the assessment. Uh, the op all of the open item types that we're envisioning are all going to be machine scored, so it's not going to be all four option multiple choice. There'll be some, you know, some uh, entries, some hot text, drag drag and drops, and some table matching, and the kind of things that you've seen. Our current vendors, Cambium, formerly known as AIR, um, formerly known as Prince, a joke for older people there. So. Um, you know, so they, you know, those item types that you see on the Cambium slash AIR products are things that we're seeing there. Um, writing is, as a matter of fact, that's part of our discussion. Uh, it, you know, later this afternoon is what to do with writing. Currently, our writing is a once a, you know, once a year. It's a, a long write, uh, generally a half day uh, event uh, written to, it's all text based in grades four through 10. And again, as I mentioned, four through six are on paper, and then seven through 10 are a computer. And at the end of the year, we take those writing responses, we roll them up with the reading response to generate a combined English language arts score. We don't report a separate scale score for writing. We report a single ELA score. And of course, districts and schools get the raw scores for the, the three components that, that make up the writing score. So the question is, are we gonna continue to do that? We've had some success with artificial intelligence scoring. Uh, there are some times where we're not quite sure, like uh, we, we think sometimes that the algorithms misidentify copy paper or copy text. Um, you know, they over-identify in some places and some things that we think uh, are under-identified. If we do go that way, you know, there's, there's, there's um, confidence levels with a machine score and we we would like to take the, the responses that are low confidence level and have those machines scored. Um, you know, so, or we could just stick with, with hand scoring and then just have that end of year score come up later when we could, when we could um, uh, you know, we can combine those scores together. So that's, that's still an open question. But uh, again, I don't see us incorporating a, a kind of an artificially intelligent scored writing during progress monitoring one or two, which again, in order to report quickly, would have to be machine all machines scored. Um, and then has Florida had the, always had the state test tied to teacher evaluations? Uh, is that a new addition? Um, it, again, just like the, um, the interim assessment has evolved over years, at one point, the value added model is what we, you know, what we used. It was required for, for teachers who taught courses that are assessed by a statewide assessment were required to use VAM. We still produce VAM scores for those teachers and whether and how districts use it is completely up to them. Some districts do use VAM, some districts don't. Some have a, you know, as a, as a, as a small component, some have a little bit heavier weight for VAM calculations. Um, but, you know, generally for statewide assessments, uh, you see schools using uh, statewide scores for those, for those teachers in, in some way, but it's left to them. Uh, Vince, when on the progress monitoring tools, do they influence each other at all? Like, so my my performance on on the first one does it influence what I do on the second, and does that inform where I start in the spring, or are they kind of mutually exclusive? That's also a, a great great question. One of the first things Don Don Peasley called me the day of the governor's announcement. <laughs> <laughs> he asked, "Do you know that what peer review requirements are?" And uh, <laughs> 
had been, you know, you know no Don. So yeah. uh, he actually mentioned that. He says people had raised that to the department where you could use those PM1 and PM2 as the, as the basically, if a student has a score on one or both of those, use it as a starting point for PM3. Um, that could be part of the study. Right now, we don't envision that. And again, especially since the first year is not gonna be really truly computer adaptive. Um, but uh, we, we, we do see that as a possibility. And if you do that, you could potentially have a shorter test, but then you get back into the question if it's a, if you could, a different test is not so bad, but a test length versus, a, you know, if students see different length tests, that could be, that could be a challenge. So. Yeah, I was just thinking, I was just yeah. thinking if you, if you had two testing events, uh, that's a lot of information on a student that could yes. maybe help you. Um, get the right items or the more efficient items in the spring. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, you know, when you think about that, if I'm a parent, if my kid absolutely blows the first and the second one out of the water, yeah. Yeah. you could still probably be perfect scores. Why would you make that kid sit for the third test? And but then, yeah. then if you've got new items out there and all of your top flyers don't see any of the new items, so any, any new items that you might, you know, you might not get all the stats the same stats for the because you've got those kids missing from you know and they're not systematically oh. missing from the pool of items you know there's a challenge there as well so lots to think there yeah i could imagine this could i mean it opened the floodgates of possibilities you know so like what you were saying you have a high flyer can you exempt them from teach uh from the spring or can you bank those performances and start using fall and winter to impact state accountability scores in the spring. And that sounds like a model that gets super complicated quickly. Yeah, and you know, the but people always talk about those pre-post, if you if you lean heavily on, you know, PM one and two, then you know, you know the gamesmanship of not, yeah. you know, not having kids perform well or not creating the best environment for them to succeed to, to make sure that you can show that growth. So, you know, that, you know just all, all kinds of considerations there that we know. And, People have talked about those kinds of things for years on pre-post. I had another question for you. Um, you know, I always hear about, um, and I think you reference it slightly, just for state accountability or for passing peer review, you have to give so many on grade level items. Is that is that kind of an art and science or is there kind of a rule of thumb on what is enough? No, we really haven't. I mean, you know, it seems like in the discussion, and again, because we've been fixed form, we don't ever have to worry about that. And when you think about it, for me, it's almost like a third rail to have any off-grade items on a test that you're using for accountability. So I don't know. I don't know. Is there a number if a kid sees two out of 60? Is that a terrible thing? You know, I, so I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Just curious. I've always heard it referenced and it makes sense, but uh, I always wondered. How much was enough? <laughs> yeah, uh, Matt brings up a really good yes. point. Um, and we see that now is right. I, you know, and one of the reasons why we were moving to all computer-based and we shifted back to paper in three through six is districts didn't have the capacity. And so although kid, any individual student wasn't spending a lot of time on testing because this student finished and the other students had to test, what do you do with those kids? So and here's the same thing. I think the point Matt's making is if you, you know, your high flyers don't have to test, what do you do with them? Do you just excuse them or do you need to put them in the gym somewhere? And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, that is a huge issue. What do you, where do you put those kids? So we're, you know, we're, we are thinking about, you know, the testing windows. We were spending up to five weeks on windows. So, uh, you know, we, we don't, we know that we can, if you have 36 week school year, if you have five week windows, you know, there's 15 weeks of testing right there out of 36, that's half your year. So we know the tests, tests need to be shorter. So the windows are shorter. So kids aren't just testing all year long. Uh, yep, and exactly the, the alignment and that scores used for accountability have to reflect performance on grade level items. And yep, I said, oh, so Ellen's on. Hi, Ellen. Yep. So will there be, um, do you envision like, uh, I think in our in our area of the world, they really uh, school teachers and principals really appreciate projected scores. Is that so? Is PM one and PM two? Is it truly? This is where your kids are at. This is where they're ready to learn. 
would you envision it projecting, okay, this is kind of what we anticipate uh, their achievement to be on in spring? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and again, I think this is another reason for doing this that I really, I sort of touched on at the beginning, but I, you know, this kind of brings it into play. We know, as I mentioned, the concern about these iReadies and the stars and so forth, not, not being aligned to the state test. Well, we know they're not aligned, but they're certainly correlated. I think, you know, every state sees this, there's a high degree of correlation between, you know, the, your kids, if they do really, really well on the iReadies and the stars or the maps, generally you'll see them do well on those end of year tests and vice versa. And so the, we think one of the values here is if this is our own homegrown test, it won't just be correlation, it'll be a good prediction of, of, either, of content that actually aligns. So a good, you know, good prediction, not just a correlation. So good point. Yeah. Any, any other questions for Vince and- Yeah, I see, boy, Florida Ellen's on. on. I could wonder if I said anything that Ellen's gonna take me. <laughs> she did speak up. <laughs> yeah, she's lurking. She'll call me later. So um, no, uh, the length of the testing window, again, that's, we're still, uh, kind of sussing that all out right now. Um, we know that the, the minute, this, if this bill passes, the minute it passes, they're going to start asking about implementation and, and window length and everything. So we know those questions are coming. We're not really ready to, to talk about that. I mean, again, like we currently do five weeks and we know that's a non-starter. So, um, you know, so we, so something, something less than that time, but then we also need to think about what is it really going to take I think devices, uh, you know, you'll hear some people say, well, we went remote and it, we were basically one-to-one -one for all these kids that were out there or some district, your districts are already using some kind of progress monitoring. Well, two things we're hearing loud and clear from districts large and small is that devices either didn't come back or didn't come back in working order, you know, so they're really not one-to-one -one for one thing. And then as far as the progress monitoring, um, they say, well, you do, you do progress monitoring now, but we know that some districts or most districts don't test 100% of their students. Um, I'll go back to you know, the high flyer discussion. If student, if teachers, if schools already know that you've got some percentage that are ready to go and you can accelerate them on some other things, um, you know, so, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you, uh, you're now you're testing 100% of the kids, whether they're high flyers or not. So I think that that adds to the need for devices and then it adds to the actual time that you need for the testing. And there's a question from Glenn. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, let's say, there's just a question about the, the PM3. That's going to be currently envisioned to be the state test. That, that progress monitoring test three is hopefully going to be long enough and at the end of the year. So we'll, we're currently thinking of using that, that test and that test only until a study might tell us something that we can do something different. But that last one will be the V, v test. Okay. A question, a question I know I would get asked um, if we rolled this out in, in our district. Um, our teachers utilize the falls and the winter score to guide, I guess, maybe third party uh, tools, like more instructional tools. And I think, um, like you mentioned, I ready a few times. I feel like that's kind of, kind of built in. But is it is there any possibility of um, of taking your PM one results and being able to take the results and the scores and plug them into uh, uh, like a Khan Academy or some type of Google Classroom set of lessons to help kids catch up? I think a lot of districts already. Again, my district colleagues out there can answer this question. They already do that a lot. You know, the student information systems, they, they try to talk across, um, you know, from the state test and, and get put into another system. So I think I think you'll see that along, along with the state test. And you kind of bring up another point I wanted to mention. The law is also actually also silent on whether districts are allowed to use something else. So you can imagine, you know, we heard from like one superintendent saying, I don't know what this thing is. This is a brand new thing. Um, I, I have, I use product X and I know product X works for me. And so you can give me these progress monitoring one and two, but I'm going to use what I already know to make sure that, you know, I'm on track. So 
Um, I don't see I don't see any language in the law that forbids districts from using yet another tool for you know either for a Khan Academy for instruction or another yet there, yet another different progress monitoring. All the moms and dads would be sort of that moms and dads would be uh, might might be a little bit upset that their kids are getting tested even more. So. Um, and then a, a question about uh, teachers receiving a student report by skill and skill mastery. I think that speaks to test length. I think, you know, obviously the more detail and diagnostic information you want, the more questions you need to ask, which then puts you at odds with, you know, your, your desire to streamline tests. So I definitely don't see a report by skill. I see us trying to provide enough information to give reporting category or, or you know, subgroup reporting. But even then, I don't think you're gonna, you know, you won't be able to say much about, you know, how well you did in reporting category, because again, that would require a longer test. And as I mentioned, we're already at two days for, you know, an ELA test and two days for a math test, and, you know, the desire is to not, you know, to go down to one day. One last thought I had: um, you mentioned remote testing, and that's super intriguing to me with COVID. Um, we chose to test some kids. Um, remotely. Uh, we have some high stakes graduation requirement assessments that we locally built and uh, we administered in a pretty small scale remote, but then we also did some larger scale. Um, and in some cases it went super, you know, super, no problems. Uh, like the older kids had two devices, we kind of had a phone and then the district issued machine and we kind of was able to proctor it a little bit. Um, and in some cases, we had kindergartners or first graders where aunt, grandma, um, older brother or something was trying to help. Uh, but then the, their, the lockdown browser wouldn't allow Zoom to be up as well. And there were just a lot of issues. Could you comment on some of, I don't know, successes or challenges or just you guys test so many kids that I would just be curious on your impression of remote testing? Well, I'm... I may be alone or one of the few people that thinks about this, but I almost think about remote testing the way we used to think about computer-based testing or even computer adaptive testing. It's like, how, how could you even consider that? It's, you know, you just can't do it. But, you know, I will say we, we are doing our first ever foray into remote testing. We are requirement in law to have a Florida civic literacy exam. I think many other states have the same kind of akin to the U.S. You know, the immigration naturalization test. We have developed our own form uh, that's based on state law, and we are actually letting uh, the Florida college system students, this is a whole different kind of accountability, students must pass a, a test of civic literacy in order to receive an AA or an AS or a BA or BS in whatever subject area, right? So there's talk about high stakes. Yeah. And also know that a lot of colleges and university students are having students that are, that are joining remotely and never set foot on, on a campus. So we are allowing some remote testing there. And I think those kinds of, you know, at the statewide level, even though your college student is an entirely different animal from a, you know, a K-12, you've got, you know, your privacy issues and, and permissions and those kinds of things. We're trying to take to see what we learn from this very narrow foray into, into remote testing and see where that takes us. And there's another interest in, we have, as you mentioned, we have a lot of military kids, a lot of mobile kids that leave the state, and, but they still want to get a Florida, you know, they want to finish their coursework in Florida, whether it's K through high school, through graduation. Then there's interest in, in allowing students who, whose parents move to a different base out of state. Um, and again, you know, we're not talking about a huge amount, but with, you know, several thousand kids take those assessments remotely. So I think we've got a couple of places where kind of like we're thinking about this, you know, through your assessment, um, trying to take off, bite off little chunks. Uh, and if we can learn from those things and, and have those be successful and take those lessons learned and apply them on a broader scale, we can, we can do this maybe, for example, our, our virtual students that are within the state. But we're not, again, we're not there yet. I mean, we're not there yet. Sure. Yeah, I know College Board did a lot of uh, remote testing. Um, ACT at one point was talking about heading down that road, and I think they've maybe changed their priorities a bit. But yeah, I, I agree. I think there's great potential and it allows for flexibility. Um, so yeah, just curious your thoughts. 
you know, yeah, I, took, I, you know, I took the PMP exam, you know, the project management professional exam, yeah. you know, at, at my home desk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would ever and passed. And, um, you know, that was, I didn't think that would ever come to pass, but, uh, I, you know, it, we did, it was through the Pearson U system. So that was, again, I'm an, an adult and, you know, no parents or kids or babies or whatever else, you know, grandchildren or whatever, cats or dogs. Um, so it worked for me, but, you know, just the fact that, that you're seeing inroads, um, you know, there, there's, I think it's, it may be a longer runway, but I see it out there for K-12. Sure. Hey, Elda asked a, a, a good question in the chat about um, like promoting kids mid-year. Yeah, uh, we've always had that, um, you yeah. know, students have been retained for whatever reason in third grade, they're retained. Um, and, and there are quite a, quite a few kids that, that follow their state board rule and guidelines for mid-year promotions. So we have students that do meet those requirements and are promoted mid-year. And this would just be yet another of the many, many options that are out there to, to do that. Sure, makes sense. Any parting questions for Vince? Um, Vince, really appreciate it. this. Is, this is super intriguing with the volume of testing you guys are doing and, and moving to online and moving to adaptive. Uh, many, many parts are, are moving. So really appreciate you being here and appreciate everybody chiming in with all the good questions. Yeah, so, somebody may have heard me say this before, but you know, I used to fly for the Navy and I you know, ejected from an airplane, lost my hand and retired. And um, I sometimes think that was the second most terrifying career I've ever had. And this is now the first. <laughs> <laughs> so all right well awesome hey have a, have a great uh, weekend everybody and thanks for being here take care vince thank you take care bye, -bye.